Namaste. So this is quite an exciting series. It's really, you know, the kind of stuff I can really sink my claws into. <laughs> this uh, Shankara's philosophy and Brahma Sutras, I mean, this is like, this is where I like to hang out. This is my playground. This is where I run and jump and swim and dive and, you know, pick up pretty stones off of the beach and you know, that kind of stuff. Because other scriptures just like don't do it for me anymore. I'm sorry, you know. But even the great Puranas and what to speak of, you know, the other stuff, just seems sort of like you know, less fun, much less fun. So where are we? I think I need to slow things down, <laughs> judging by the response I'm getting, or actually not getting, that uh, nobody seems to uh, really understand to be able to formulate a comment or a question. So, okay, orientation time. The first sutra, which is also the first arikarana, or topic, in the Brahma Sutras, is atato brahma jignasa. Now, therefore, let us inquire into Brahman. And, of course, the opponent has to pipe up right away, you know. He can't let us have too much fun. He has to come up and say, well, why do you want to do that anyway? You know, you can't even define Brahman. Brahman is so transcendental. It's so beyond everything. It's beyond the beyond. So, you know, what are you talking about? Right? And so Shankaracharya calmly receives this criticism and then says, well, the aphorist Vyasadeva who wrote these sutras, anticipates that you will object in this way, that you will oppose us in this way. Uh, basically by denigrating Brahman to, you know, the place of something that's not even worth talking about. I mean, just because we can't talk about it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, at least. Huh? Because that might give us some idea of what Brahman is in itself. But I'll get to that. I'm getting to that. The next sutra, which is also the next Adhikarana, is Janmad Yasya Yataha. You want to know what Brahman is? Brahman is that which is the origin of basically everything. That's the definition. And, of course, the opponent, you know, has to squeak up again <laughs> with his little mind, right? Uh, and say, okay, okay, so you defined it. Now, this sounds to me like it's simply an inference. It's simply using logic to construct something that you call Brahman, and then you assign tremendous powers and so on to it. This is the basic argument of the atheist. The atheist denigrates and, and diminishes whatever symbol, whatever name, whatever concept we put up as the absolute. And here he's saying, you know, this is just a, an ideal of yours, as the Buddha would say, hammered out by logic. In other words, it's a fabrication. It's not real. It's just something you made up so that you can have this cool-sounding philosophy. And so what does Shankaracharya say? He goes into epistemology. He said there are two ways to know something. By the symbols or descriptions about it, let's say, for example, 
something that's in the future. And he gives the example of religious rites. Maybe you've never done a certain religious sacrifice, like Agnihotra, and you want to do it. So you look up in the scriptures, the instructions, how to do the Agnihotra. But the Agnihotra itself is still in the future. It hasn't happened yet. You're trying to learn how to do it so you can make it happen. So you go to the scriptures. And this is a prescriptive use of knowledge. Do this. Do it this way. Do it like that at this time and so on. Then there's another form of knowledge, which is descriptive knowledge. And descriptive knowledge is based on something in the present that really exists and then describing it according to its nature. In other words, instead of making a thing out of symbols, now we're making symbols about a thing. Couldn't be more different. Actually, the reverse process completely. So this is where we're at right now, about two-thirds of the way through the commentary on the second Adhikarana, which is also the second sutra. Shankaracharya has brought up that the only way to know something transcendental is by examining its nature as it is. And to do that, you have to experience it. You can't experience a logical inference. It is always and only an idea made of words. But you can experience something real that exists and then come back and say, hey, you know, that description you gave me of Brahman, dude, it was right on. You know? <laughs> so let's pick up where we left off the last time. Opponent. If Brahman be an existing reality, it must be the object of other means of valid knowledge, so that any deliberation on the Upanishadic texts for the knowledge of Brahman becomes meaningless. Vedantin, not so, for Brahman's relation with anything cannot be grasped, it being outside the range of sense perception. The senses naturally comprehend objects, and not Brahman. Had Brahman been an object of sense perception, knowledge would have been of the form, this product is related to, that is, produced by, Brahman. Again, even when the mere effect, that is, the universe, is cognized, one cannot ascertain whether it is related to Brahman as its cause, or to something else. Therefore, the aphorism, that from which, etc., is not meant to present an inference. The present sutra is, that which is the source of the material universe must be Brahman. And there's two reasons for this. One is an inference, yes. The inference is that, well, it couldn't be anything else because nothing else is powerful enough to create the world as we experience it. But there's another reason, that the existence and nature of Brahman is described by the Upanishads. And the Brahma Sutra is the correct explanation of the Upanishads in response to a fancied opponent who criticizes it's like every other sutra, you know? Every other sutra, there's an opponent who steps up and says, eh, no, you're not so fast. <laughs> and then gives some, you know, half-baked reason. <laughs> and then Shankaracharya proceeds to demolish this comment, this criticism, with sound logic and quotes from the Upanishads. Therefore, the aphorism, that from which, etc., is not meant to present an inference. For what is it, then? For presenting an Upanishadic text. Which, again, is that Upanishadic text that is sought to be referred to by the aphorism? It is this. Starting with Brigu, 
The well-known son of Varuna approached his father Varuna with the request, O revered sir, teach me Brahman. The Taittiriya Upanishad states, Seek to know that from which all these beings take birth, that by which they live after being born, and that towards which they proceed and into which they merge. That is Brahman. Taittiriya 3.1 And the answer settling the question is, From bliss certainly all these beings originate. They live by bliss after being born, and towards bliss they proceed, and into bliss they get merged. Taittiriya 3.6 Other texts, too, of the same class are to be quoted in this connection, which speak of a cause that is by nature eternal, pure, and free, and intrinsically omniscient. You see why I love this stuff? <laughs> there is simply no literature in the world of any kind that can match the thrilling scope of these Upanishadic, Vedantic, and Brahma Sutric commentaries. It just doesn't exist. And if it did exist, it probably wouldn't be understandable <laughs> to us today, as we are so steeped in logic. And when we come in contact with something transcendental, which is simply asserted, our brains tend to balk at it. We tend to resist it irrationally, because we are so much convinced that Without evidence, a priori, there can be no truth, at least no verification. But see, this is knowledge coming from a different age. This is coming from an age where trust, especially trust in the religious authorities and even the kings, was actually merited. Because this was before all the religious lineages became corrupted by commercialism. So when someone like Vyasadeva or the unknown authors of the Upanishads say something, the ancient Vedic people took it on faith and then lived by it. And this is precisely the method of realizing Brahman. You have to believe in it first. Why? Because Brahman is an ontological entity. It can be known only by the necessity of some source supplying the being, knowledge, or conscious awareness, and bliss, that is the foundation of everything. If we take a look at the empirical universe, there doesn't seem to be any source. There is nothing observable that would account for these phenomena, being, consciousness, and bliss. Therefore, by inference, something must exist to, that supplies these ingredients of the creation, of the manifestation. So that thing is what we call Brahman. All right, so if everything is Brahman, I am also Brahman. And if I can look at my experience from that place, from that point of view that I am Brahman, and then I look at my experience. Then I look at the world and my senses and the contents of my mind and so forth. I will see something completely different than a conditioned being sees. Because a conditioned being overwrites, uh, fabricates, projects, overlays, superimposes 
a whole string of assumptions about the existence of I, the individual self, small I, small s in self. So in the same way, when one comes instead from the assumption that aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, the world looks very different. Without the screen, the terministic screen or ontological network of reductionistic materialism in which we are all highly conditioned. Try it and see. That's my best advice. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>